Hello, this is Matthew from Simply Learn, and today we're going to go through part one of a two part series on interview questions that you are likely to be asked if you are interviewing for a job that focuses on DevOps. So there are approximately seven sections that we cover in DevOps. We go from general DevOps questions, source code management with tools such as Git, uh, continuous integration, and here we'll focus on Jenkins, continuous testing with tools such as Selenium. And then you also have the operations side of DevOps, which is your configuration management with tools such as uh, Chef, Puppet, and Ansible, containerization with Docker, and then continuous monitoring with tools such as Nagios. So let's just get into those general DevOps questions. So one of the questions that you're going to be asked is how is DevOps different from Agile? And, and the, the reality is, is that DevOps is a cultural way of being able to deliver solutions that's different from Agile. If we look at the evolution of delivery over the last five to 10 years, we've gone from waterfall um, based delivery to Agile delivery, which is on uh, sprints to where we are with continuous integration and continuous delivery around DevOps. The whole concept of DevOps is culturally very, very different from Agile. And the difference is, is that you're looking at being able to do continuous releases. What does that mean? The difference is, is that you want to be able to send out code continuously to your production environment. That means the operations team, the development team have to be working together. That means that any code that gets created has to be able to go to production very quickly, which means you need to be testing your code continuously. And then and that production environment must also be able to be tested continuously and any changes or any errors that come up have to be communicated effectively and efficiently back to the dev and op team. Another area in which I see that DevOps is different is really the response that we have for how we engage with the customer. So the customer is coming to your website, to your mobile app, to your chatbot or any digital solution that you have and has an expectation. When you're going through and actually doing doing a DevOps uh, paradigm, the old model would be that you would capture requirements from the customer, then you do your development, then you do your testing, and there would be these barriers between each of those. As we move faster through from Waterfall to Agile, what we saw is that with Agile, we were able to respond much faster to customer demands. So instead of it being weeks or months, sometimes in some cases years between releases of software, what we saw it would was a transition to weeks and months for releases on software. Now we see with DevOps is that the release cycle has shrunk even further with the goal of continuously delighting the customer. How further has that release cycle shrunk to? There are companies that have gone from having releases of once a week or once every two weeks or once a month to now having multiple releases a day. Indeed, some companies have up to 50 releases a day. This isn't something to also bear in mind is that each of those releases are tested and verified against test records so that you can guarantee that the code that's going to production is going to be good continuous code. So what are the differences between the different phases of DevOps? So effectively, there are two main phases of DevOps. There's the planning and coding phase, and then there's the deploying phase. And you have a tool such as Jenkins that allows you to integrate between both environments. So some of the core benefits that you may have to DevOps are going to be some technical benefits and some business benefits. So when somebody asks you, what are the benefits of DevOps, you can reply that from a technical point of view, you're able to use continuous software delivery to constantly push out code that has been tested and verified against scripts that have been written and approved. You can be able to push out smaller chunks of code so that when you have an issue, you're not having to go through massive blocks of code or massive projects. You're going through just very small microservices or small sections of code and you're able to detect and correct problems faster. On the business side, the benefits are absolutely fantastic from a customer that's coming to your website and or to your mobile app. They're going to see responses happening 
continuously so that the customer is always aware that you as a company are listening to their demands and responding appropriately. You're able to provide a more stable environment and you're able to scale that environment to the demands of the number of customers that are using your services. So how will you approach a project that needs to implement DevOps? So this is really an exciting area for you to be in. So there are effectively three stages when it comes to actually working in a DevOps. The first stage is an assessment stage. And think of this as the back of the napkin ideation stage. This is where you are sitting with a business leader and they're giving you ideas of what they would like to see from feedback that they've had from their customers. This is blue sky opportunity. This is thinking of big ideas. That second stage, and this often comes as a fast follow to stage one, is actually proving out that concept. So developing a proof of concept. And a proof of concept can actually be a multiple different things. So it could be something as simple as a wireframe, or it could be something that is as complex as a mini version of the final application. Depending on the scope of the work that you're delivering will really depend on how complicated you want the POC to be. But with that in mind, whatever choice you make, you have to be able to deliver enough in the POC so that when you present this to a customer, Customer, they're able to respond to that creation that you've developed and able to give you feedback to be able to validate that you are going with the right solution and able to provide the right product to your customers. That third stage is where you get into your DevOps stage. And this is just the exciting part. This is where the rubber hits the road and you start releasing code based on a backlog of features that are being requested for the solution. In contrast to doing agile delivery, where you just continuously work through a backlog, with DevOps, what you're also looking at is putting in analytics and sensors to be able to validate that you are being successful with the solution that's being delivered. So that once you actually start delivering out code that customers can interact with, you want to be able to see what are the pieces of the solution that they are using, what do they like, what is complicated, where are the failure points, and you want to use that data and feed that back into your continuous integration and have that as a means to be able to backfill the demand of work that gets completed in the backlog. So what is the difference between continuous delivery and continuous deployment? So continuous delivery is based on putting out code that can be deployed safely to production and ensures that your businesses and functions are running as you would expect them to be. So it's going through and completing the code that you'd actually see. Continuous deployment, in contrast, is all about ensuring that you're automating the deployment of a production environment. So you're able to go through and scale up your environment to meet the demands of both the solution and the customer. This makes software development and release processes much more faster and more robust. So if we look here, we can actually see where continuous integration and continuous deployment come hand in hand. So when you actually start out with the initial pushes of your code, that's where you're doing your continuous integration and your continuous delivery. And then at some point, you want to get very comfortable with deploying the code that you're creating so that it's being pushed out to your production environment. So one of the things that's great about working with the tools that you use in a DevOps continuous continuous integration and continuous delivery model is that the development tools that you use, uh, the containerization tools, the testing tools should always reflect the production environment. And what this means is that when you actually come to deploying solutions to production, there are no surprises because your development team have been working against that exact same environment all the way through. So a question that you'll also be asked is, you know, what is the role of a configuration management in DevOps? And so the role of configuration management really has three distinct areas. And the first, and this is really the obvious one, and this is the one where you probably already have significant experiences, is the ability to manage and handle large changes to multiple systems in seconds rather than days, hours, or weeks, as that may have happened before. The second area is that you want to also 
demonstrate the business reasons for having configuration management. And the business reason here is that it allows IT and infrastructure to standardize on resource configurations. And this has a benefit in that you're able to do more with fewer people. So instead of having a large configuration team, you can actually have a smaller, more highly skilled team that's able to actually manage an even larger operational environment. And thirdly, you want to be able to highlight the ability to scale. So if you have configuration management tools, you're able to manage a significant number of servers and domains that may have multiple servers in. It allows you to effectively manage servers that are deployed on cloud or private cloud and allow you to do this with high accuracy. So how does continuous monitoring help and maintain the entire architecture of the system? So when this question comes up, you want to dig in and show your knowledge on how configuration and continuous monitoring is able to control an entire environment. So the number one topic that you want to bring up when it comes to continuous monitoring is that with being able to effectively monitor your entire network 24 seven for any changes as they happen, you're able to identify and report those faults or threats immediately and respond immediately for your entire network instead of having to wait as it happens sometimes for a customer to email or call you and say, hey, your website's down. Nobody wants that. That's an embarrassing thing. The other three areas that you want to be able to highlight are the ability to be able to ensure that the right software and the right services are running on the right resources. That's your number one takeaway that you want to be able to give of continuous monitoring. The second is to be able to monitor the status of those servers continuously. This is not requiring manually monitoring, but having a agent that's monitoring those servers continuously. And then the third is that by scripting out and continuously monitoring your entire environment, you're creating a self audit trail that you can take back and demonstrate the effectiveness of the operations environment that you are providing. So one of the cloud companies that is a strong advocate for DevOps is Amazon's web services, AWS. And they have uh, really five distinct areas um, that you can zero in on for services. So when the question comes up, what is the role of AWS in DevOps? You want to really hold out your hand and list off five areas of focus using your thumb and finger. So you want to have flexible services, built for scale, automation, secure, and a large partner ecosystem. And having those five areas will really be able to help demonstrate why you believe that AWS and, and other cloud providers, but AWS is certainly the leader in this space, are great for being able to provide support for the role of DevOps. So one of the things that we want to be able to do effectively when we're releasing any kind of solution is to be able to measure that solution. And so KPIs are very important. So you will be asked for three important DevOps KPIs. And so three that really come to mind that are very effective. The first one is mean time to failure recovery. And what this talks about is what is the average time does it take to recover from a failure? And if you have experience doing this, then look at the experience you have and use a specific example where you are able to demonstrate that mean time to failure recovery. The second is deployment frequency. And with deployment frequency, you want to be able to discuss how often do you actually deploy solutions and what actually happens when you're actually doing those deployments and what does the impact to your network look like when you're doing those deployments. And then the third one is really tied to that deployment frequency, which is around what is the percentage of failed deployments deployments. And so um, how many times did you deploy to a server and something happened where the server itself failed? What we're looking for when you're going through and being asked for these KPIs is experience with actually doing a DevOps deployment and being able to understand what DevOps looks like when you're pushing out your infrastructure. And then the second is being able to validate that self auditing ability. And one word of caution is don't go in there and say that you have 100% success. Uh, the reality is that servers do degrade over time. And you maybe want to uh, talk about a time when a server did degrade in your environment and use that as a story for how you were able to successfully get over and solve that degradation. So 
One of the terms that is very popular at the moment is infrastructure as code. And so you're going to be asked to explain infrastructure as code. And really, it's, it's something that actually becomes a byproduct of the work you have to do when you're actually putting together your DevOps environment. And infrastructure as code really refers to the writing of code to actually manage your environment. And you can go through many of the other tools that we've covered in this series, but you'll see that uh, XML or Ruby or YAML are used as languages to describe the configuration for your environment. This allows you to then create the rules and instructions that can be read by the machines that are actually setting up the physical hardware versus a traditional model which is having software and installing that software directly onto the machine. This is really important when it comes to cloud computing. There really is a strong emphasis of being able to explain infrastructure as a service and infrastructure as code is fundamental to the foundation to infrastructure as service. And then finally, it allows you to be able to talk about how you can use scripted languages such as YAML to be able to create a consistent experience for your entire network. All right, so let's now get into the next section, which is source code management. And we're going to focus specifically on Git. The reason being is that Git is really the most popular source code management solution right now. There are other technologies out there, but for the types of distributed environments that we have, uh, source code management with Git is uh, probably the most effective. So the first question you'll be asked when it comes to Git is to talk about the difference between centralized and distributed version control. And if we look at the way that the two are set up, older technologies such as older versions of Team Foundation Server, though the current version does actually have Git in it, but older versions required a centralized server uh, for you to check in and check out of code. The developer in the centralized uh, system does not have all the files uh, for uh, the application and if the centralized server crashes then you actually lose all of the history of your code now in contrast a distributed model actually we do check in our code to a server however for you to be effective and building out your solution you actually check out all of the code for the solution directly onto your local development machine so you can actually have a copy of the entire solution running on your local machine this allows you to be able to work effectively offline it really allows uh, for scalability when it comes to building out your team so if you have a team uh, that may be in Europe. You can actually then scale that team with people from Asia, from North America or South America very easily and not have to worry about whether or not they have the right code or the wrong code. And in addition to that, if the actual main server where you're checking in your code does crash, it's not a big deal because you actually have, each person has a copy of the code. So as soon as the server comes back up, you have to check back in and everybody's running back uh, as if there was nothing had happened at all. So one of the questions you'll be asked is to give the answer to some of the commands you use for working with Git. So if you were to be asked a question is, what is the Git command that downloads any repository from GitHub to your computer? On the screen, we have four options. We have Git push, Git fork, Git clone, and Git commit. The answer in this instance would be Git clone. Now, if you want to be able to push code from your local system to a GitHub repository using Git, then first of all, you want to be able to do is connect the local repository to a remote repository. And in the example, you may want to talk about using the command git remote add origin and then the actual path to a GitHub repository. You could, if you wanted to actually at this point, also talk about other repositories such as GitLab that you can also work with or a private Git repository that would be used just for the development team. Once you've actually then added the uh, local repository into your uh, local computer, then the second um, action you want to use is a push, which is to actually push your local files out to the uh, master environment. So you use the command git push origin master. 
So one question you may be asked is, what is the difference between a bare repository and a standard way of initializing a Git repository? So let's look through what is the standard way. So the standard way using Git in it allows you to create a working directory using the command Git in it. And then the folder that creates is the folder that creates all the revision history related to the work that you're doing. In contrast, Using the bare way, you have a different commands for setting that up. So it would be git init dash dash bare, and it does not contain any working or checked out source files locally on your machine. In addition, the revision history is actually stored in the root folder versus a subfolder that you would have with the normal git init initialization. So which of the following CLI commands would you be used to rename a file? So we have git rm, git mv, git rm r, or none of the above. Well, in this instance, it would be git mv. A question that you'll be asked around commit is going to be, what is the process to revert a commit that has already been pushed and made public? And there are two ways you can address this. The first is to actually um, address the bad file in the new commit, and you can use the command git commit dash m, and then put in a comment for why that file is being removed. The second is to actually create a new commit that actually undoes all the changes that were made with the bad commit. And then to do that, you would use git revert and then the commit ID and the commit ID uh, could be something such as uh, 56DE0938F, but you'd have to find that from the, the commit that you had made, but that would allow you to revert any bad files that you had submitted. So there are two ways of being able to get files from a Git repository, and you're going to be asked to explain the difference between Git fetch and Git pull. So Git fetch allows you to fetch and download only new data from a new repository. It does not integrate any of the new data into your working files, and it can be undone at any time if you wanted to um, break out the remote tracking branches. In contrast, Git pull updates the current head branch with the latest changes from the remote server. So you get all of the files um, downloaded. It downloads new data and integrates it with the current working files you have on your system. And it tries to merge remote changes with your local ones. So one of the questions you'll get asked about Git is what is a Git stash? So as a developer, you will be working on the current branch within a solution. But what happens if you come up with an idea where it's something that will take a different amount of time for you to be able to complete, but you don't want to interrupt the mainline branch. So what you can actually do is you can actually create a branch that allows you to start working on your own work outside of the mainline branch. And this is called git stash. It allows you to be able to modify your files without interrupting the mainline branch. So you, once you start talking about branching in Git, be prepared to answer and explain the concept of branching. So essentially what it allows you to do is have a mainline master branch that has all the code that the team is checking in and checking out against, but allows you to have an indefinite number of branches that allows for new features to be built in parallel to the mainline branch. And then at some point be reintroduced to the mainline branch to allow the team to add in new features. And so if we look through the merge and get rebase, these are the two features that you'd be using continuously to be able to talk about how you take a branch and merge it back into the mainline branch. So on the left hand side, we have git merge, which allows you to take the code that you're creating and merge it back into the master. On the right hand side, what you have is a slightly different approach. This is for projects where you reach a point in a project where you go, okay, we're going to effectively restart the project at this point in time. And we want to ignore the complete history that's happened before that. And that's called git rebase. And that would allow 
allow you to rewrite the project history by creating a brand new mainline branch that ignores all other previous branches that have happened before it. You can, if you want to, very quickly and easily find out all the files that have been used to make a particular commit. So when somebody asks you the question, how do you find a list of files that has been changed in a particular commit, you can actually say that all you have to go is find the command git diff dash tree dash r and then the hash that you would use for the commit and that would actually then give you a breakdown of all the files that have been made with that particular commit a question that you'll be asked when you're talking about merging files is what is a merge conflict in git and how can it be resolved? So essentially a merge conflict is when you have uh, two or more branches that are competing with commits in Git and you have to be able to determine which is the appropriate files that need to be submitted. And this is where you would go in and to actually help resolve this issue, you'd actually go in and manually edit the conflicted files to select the changes you want to keep in the final merge. So let me go through the steps that you would take to be able to illustrate this when you're talking about this particular question in your interview. Now there are essentially four stages. The first would be under the repository name, you want to select a pull request and uh, you want to be able to show how that pull request would be demonstrated inside of GitHub. So within the pull request, there's going to be a highlight of conflict markers and you'll be able to select which conflicts um, you want to keep and which you want to merge and which ones you want to change. So if we just step through how you would actually resolve a merge conflict. Uh, the first step would be under GitHub you want to be able to pull the repository name and then the pull request around that repository. In the pull request list, click the pull request with a merge conflict and that you'd like to be able to resolve. Now pull up a file that will list out um, all of the conflicts for you. Near the bottom of that file will be a list of the requests that need to be resolved. And then if you need to make a decision on which branches you want to keep or which ones you want to change, that will have to be something you have to put in instructions in inside of the file. You'll actually see that there are conflict markers within the instructions, which are going to ask you which files you want to change and which ones you want to keep. If you have more than one merge conflict in your file, scroll down to the next set of conflict markers and repeat steps four and five until you resolve all of the uh, conflicts. You will want to mark your file as resolved in GitHub so that the repository knows that uh, you are having everything resolved. If you have more than one file with a conflict, then you want to go then onto the next file and start working on those files and just keep repeating the steps we've done up to this point until you have all of the conflicts resolved. And then once you have all of the resolutions created, then you want to select the button which is commit merge and then merge all your files back into to GitHub and this will take care and manage the resolution of the merge conflict within GitHub. So you can also do this uh, through command line and with the uh, command line you want to use a uh, git bash and so you want to as a first step open up git bash and then navigate to the local git repository in command line by using the cd change directory and then list out the, the actual folder where you actually are putting all of your code and then uh, you want to be able to generate a list of the files that are affected uh, with the merge conflict. And in this instance here, you can actually see the uh, file styleguide.md has a merge conflict in it. And as before, with working with GitHub, you actually go through and use a, um, a text editor um, and you can use any text editor, but as you go through and edit out what you want to keep and what you want to uh, manage in your conflict. So you actually have a resolution that's being created so that you'll be able to then, once you, you're using the conflict markers, you can actually merge your files together so that the solution itself will allow you to incorporate your commits effectively into the resolution. Once you've gone through and applied your changes, you're able to then merge the conflicted commits into a single commit and able to push that up to your remote repository. All right, let's talk about the next section, which is continuous integration with Jenkins. So the first question you'll be asked about with Jenkins is explain a master slave architecture of Jenkins. So the way that Jenkins is set up is that the Jenkins master will pull code from your remote Git repository, such as GitHub, and will check that repository every time there is a code commit. It will distribute the workload of that code and the 
tests that need to be applied to that code to all of the Jenkins slaves. And then on request, the Jenkins master and the slaves will then carry out all the builds and tests to be able to produce test reports. The next question you'll be asked is, what is a Jenkins file? And simply put, a Jenkins file is a text file that has a definition of the Jenkins pipeline and is checked into a source code repository. And this really allows for three distinct things to happen. One, it allows for a code review and iteration of the pipeline. It permits an audit trail for that pipeline and also provides a single source of truth for the pipeline, which can be viewed and edited. So which of the following commands runs Jenkins from the command line? Is it java-jar jenkins.war, java-war jenkins.jar, java.jar jenkins.jar, java-war jenkins.war? And the answer is A, java-jar jenkins.war. So when working with Jenkins, you're going to be asked, what are the key concepts and aspects of working with a Jenkins pipeline? And you want to really hold out your fingers here and go through four key areas, and that is pipeline, node, step, and stay. So pipeline refers to the user-defined model of a CD continuous delivery pipeline. Node are the machines which, is, which are part of that Jenkins environment within the pipeline. Step is a single task that tells Jenkins what to do at that particular point in time. And then finally, stage defines a conceptually distinct subset of tasks performed through the entire pipeline. And tasks could be build, test, and deploy. So which of the following file is used to define dependency in Maven? And do we have a build.xml, b pom.xml, c dependency.xml, or d version.xml and the answer is palm.xml. Working with Jenkins, you're going to be asked to explain the two types of pipeline used in Jenkins along with the syntax. And so a scripted pipeline is based on Groovy script as their domain specific language for Jenkins. And there are one or more node blocks that are used throughout the entire pipeline. On the left hand side, you can actually see what the actual script would look like. And the right hand side shows what the actual declaration for each section of that script would be. The second type of Jenkins pipeline is a declarative pipeline. And a declarative pipeline provides a simple and a friendly syntax to define what the pipeline should look like. And then you can actually, at this point, use an example to actually break out how blocks are used to define the work completed in a declarative pipeline. So how do you create a copy and backup of Jenkins? Well, to create a backup, periodically backup Jenkins to your Jenkins home directory, and then create a copy of that directory. It's really as simple as that. A question you'll be asked as well is how can you copy Jenkins from one server to another? Well, there are essentially, there are three ways to do that. One is you can move a job from one installation of Jenkins to another by copying the corresponding job directory. The second would be to create a copy of an existing job directory and making a clone of that job directory, but with a different name. And the third is to rename an existing job by renaming a directory. So security is fundamental to all the work that we do within DevOps. And Jenkins provides the center core to all the work that gets completed within a DevOps environment. There are three ways in which you can apply security to authenticate users effectively. And when you are asked about this question of security within Jenkins, the three responses you want to be able to provide is a Jenkins has its own internal database that uses secured user data for, and user credentials. B is you can use a LDAP or lightweight directory access protocol server to be able to authenticate Jenkins users. Or C, you can actually configure Jenkins to authenticate by using such as OAuth, which is a more modern method of being able to authenticate users. You're going to be asked how to deploy a custom build of a core plugin within Jenkins. And essentially, the four steps that you want to go through are, first of all, copying the .hpi plugin file into the Jenkins home plugins subdirectory. Uh, you want to remove the plugins development directory if there is one. You want to create an empty file called plugin.hpi.pin. And once you've completed these three steps, Restart Jenkins and your custom build 
plugin should be available. How can you temporarily turn off Jenkins security if the administrative user has locked themselves out of the admin console? Well, this doesn't happen very often, but when it does, it's good to know how you can actually get into Jenkins and be able to resolve the problems of authenticating effectively into the system as an administrator. So when you want to be able to uh, get into a Jenkins environment, what you want to be able to do is locate the config file. You should see that it's set to true, which allows for security to be enabled. If you then change the user security setting to false, security will be disabled, allow you to make your administrative changes and will not be re-enabled until the next time Jenkins is restarted. So what are the ways in which a build can be scheduled and run in Jenkins? Well, there are four ways in which you can uh, identify the way a build can be scheduled or run in Jenkins. The first is when source code management commits new code into the repository. You can run Jenkins at that point. The second can be the, after the completion of other builds. So maybe you have multiple builds in your project that are dependent on each other. And when so many other builds have been executed, then you can have Jenkins run. You can schedule builds to run at a specified time. So you may have nightly builds of your code that illustrate the changes in the solution you're building. And then finally, you also can manually build a environment on request. Occasionally, you will want to also restart Jenkins. And so it's good that when a question around how do you restart Jenkins manually comes up that you have the answers. And there are two ways in which you can do it. One is you can force a restart without waiting for builds to complete by using the Jenkins URL that you have for your environment slash restart, or you can allow all running builds to complete before restart are required, and in which case you would use the command of the URL for your Jenkins environment slash safe restart. So let's go into the fourth and final section of this first video, which talks about continuous testing with Selenium. So the first question you will be asked most likely around Selenium are what are the four different Selenium components? And again, you will want to hold open your fingers because there are four distinct environments. You have Selenium Integrated Development Environment or Selenium IDE. You have Selenium Remote Control or Selenium RC. You have Selenium Web Driver and then Selenium Grid. You'll be asked to explain each of those areas in more detail, but let's start off with by looking at Selenium Driver. What are the different exceptions in Selenium WebDriver? So it's useful to remember that an exception is an event that occurs during the execution of a program that disrupts the normal flow of that program's instructions. And so we have four. We have a timeout exception, an element not visible exception, no such element exception, and a session not found exception. And each of those, if we step through them, are the four different types of exceptions that can be thrown up when using the Selenium web driver. So as we evolve in our digital world with the different types of products that are available for us to be able to build solutions onto multiple platforms, you're gonna be asked, can Selenium and other DevOps tools run in other environments? And so a good question around this is, can Selenium test an application in an Android web browser? And the short answer is, Absolutely, yes it can. We have to use the Android driver for it to be able to work. So you want to be able to talk about the three different types of supported test within Selenium. So when the question comes up, what are the different test types supported by Selenium? You can answer that. And there are three different types of test. First is a functional test, second is a regression test, and third is a load testing test. The functional test is a kind of black box testing in which test cases are based on a specific area or feature within the software. A regression test helps you find any specific areas that functional tests or non-functional areas of the code wouldn't be able to detect. The load testing test allows you to monitor the response of a solution as you increase the volume of hits and how you're using the code are put onto it. An additional question you'll be asked is, how can you get a text of a web element using Selenium? Well, the get command is used to retrieve text of a specific web element. Now, it's important to remember, however, that, that the command does not return any parameters, but just returns a string value. So you want to be able to capture that string value and discuss about it. 
A question you'll be asked around Selenium is, can you handle keyboard and mouse actions using Selenium? And the answer is yes, you can, but you have to make sure that you're using the Advanced User Interaction API. And the Advanced User Interaction API is something that can be scripted into your tests and it allows you for uh, capturing methods such as a click and hold and drag and drop mouse events and then keyboard down or keyboard um, up uh, key release events so that if you want to, to capture, say, the use of control shift or a specific function button off the keyboard, you'd be able to capture those. Of the following four elements, which of these elements is not a web element method? A, get text, B, size, C, get tag name, D, send keys. And it's B, size. You're going to be asked to explain what is the difference for when we use find element or find elements. And so if we look at find element, find element finds the first element in the current web page that matches the specified locator value. In contrast, find element finds all of the elements on the web page that matches the specified value. When using WebDriver, what are the driver close and driver quit commands? And these are two different methods used to close a web browser session in Selenium. So driver close will close the current web browser on which your focus is set. And driver quit closes all the browser windows and ends the WebDriver session completely. The final question that you are likely to be asked in using Selenium is how can you submit a form using Selenium? Well, in this instance, that's relatively easy. The following lines of code will let you submit a form in Selenium, which would be web element el equals driver dot find element. And then you put in the ID and the element ID and then l submit open close parentheses semicolon. So let's just get into the first section, which is configuration management. So one of the questions that you'll get asked right away is why do you have SSL certificates used for Chef? Really fundamentally, your immediate answer should be security. SSL provides for a very high level of private security and private and public key pairing. This really is essential to ensure that you have a secure environment throughout your entire network. The second part should be that if you're using SSL and you're using the private public key model within SSL, you're able to guarantee the systems on your network that the uh, chef, that you'll be able to validate that the nodes within your network that chef is validating against actually are the real nodes themselves, not imposters. So you will also be asked um, some questions um, such as the following, which of the following commands would you use to stop or disable the HTTP service when the system boots? And you'll typically get four responses and there'll be hashtag system CTL disable HTTPD dot service, or is it system disable HTTP dot service, system disable HTTPD, or the final option, which is system CTL disable HTTPD dot service. Your answer should be the first one, which is hashtag system CTL disable HTTP dot service. So Chef comes with a series of tools that allow it to function effectively. And one of the tools that you're going to be asked about is what is Test Kitchen. And Test Kitchen is essentially a command line tool that allows you to be able to test out your cookbook before you actually deploy it to a real node. So some of the commands that you would use are for instance if you want to create an instance of test kitchen you would do kitchen create if you want to destroy an instance after you created it you do kitchen destroy and if you want to be able to combine multiple instances you would do kitchen converge so a question you'll get is around chef is how does chef apply differ from chef client so fundamentally the difference between them is that chef apply will validate the recipe that you're working on, whereas Chef Client looks to apply and validate the entire cookbook that's run in your server environment. So one is focused on the recipe and the other is focused on the entire cookbook. So there are some differences when you're working with different command lines. So for instance, when you're working with uh, Puppet and you're working with one version of Puppet and you want to do what is the command to sign a requested certificate, 
The top example here is for Puppet version 2.7, whereas the lower option here is for Puppet version 3. And that's something to bear in mind when you're going through your interview process is that the tools that are used within a continuous integration, continuous delivery DevOps model do vary. And so you want to be able to talk knowledgeably about the different versions of the tools so that when you're talking to your interviewer, you're able to show the deep knowledge that you have. Which open source or community tools do you use to make Puppet more powerful? And essentially this question is gonna be asking you to look beyond the core foundation of Puppet itself. And so the three options you have is uh, being able to track configurations with Jira, which you should be doing anyway, but it's a great way to be able to clearly communicate the work that's being done with Puppet. A uh, version control can be extended with Git. And then the changes should be passed through Jenkins. So the three tools you want to be looking at, integration with Jira, Git, and Jenkins. So what are the resources in Puppet? Well, fundamentally, there are four. The resources are a basic unit of any configuration management tool. They are the features of the nodes. They are the written catalog and the execution of the catalog on a node. So as we dig deeper into Puppet, one of the things that you are likely to be asked regarding Puppet is what is a class in Puppet? And so a class in Puppet is really the name blocks in your manifest that, that contain the various configurations. And this in, can include services, files, and packages. And we have on the screen here an example of what a class would look like when you write it out. And you may want to memorize just one class. Don't memorize just a whole set of classes. Just memorize one. The person that's interviewing you is just really looking for someone who has a working knowledge. They're not looking for you to have memorized complete massive classes. But having one small class to be able to illustrate the experience you have is extremely valuable to the interviewer, particularly if it's a technical interview. So as we move into Ansible, one of the things that you're gonna be asked around Ansible is what is Ansible role? So a role is an independent block of tasks and variable files and templates embedded with inside of the playbook. So the example we have here on the screen actually shows you one role within a playbook. And in this role, it is to install Tomcat on a node. Again, as with previous question within Puppet of a class, it's probably good to have memorized just one or two roles so you can talk knowledgeably about Ansible when you're having your interview. So when you're working with Ansible, when should you be using the curly brackets? And so just as a frame of reference, uh, there's often two different ways that these kind of brackets are referred to. Uh, they're either referred to as French brackets or curly brackets. Either way, uh, what you'll be wanting to ask uh, is when would you use these specific types of brackets within Ansible? And really the answer comes down to two things. One is that it makes it easier to distinguish strings and undefined variables. And the second is for putting together conditional statements when you are actually using variables. And the example we have here is this prints the value of, and we have foo, and we have to then put in the variable conditional statement of foo is defined as something. So what is the best way to make content reusable and redistributable with Ansible? And there's really essentially three. The first is to include a submodule or another file in your playbook. The second is to import an improvement of an include, which ensures that a file is added only once. And then the third is roles to manage the tasks within the playbook. So a question you will be asked is provide a differences between Ansible and Puppets. So if we look at Ansible, it's a very easy agentless installation. It's based on Python. You can configure it with YAML and there are no support for Windows. In contrast, Puppet is an agent-based installation. It's written in Ruby. The configuration files are written in DSL and it has support on all popular operating systems. So we dig deeper into the actual architecture. Ansible, it has a much more simple architecture and it's definitely a push only architecture. In contrast to Puppet, it's a more complicated but more sophisticated architecture where you're able to have a complete environment managed by the Puppet architecture. So let's get on to our next section, which is containerization. 
So let's go through and you're going to be asked to explain what the architecture of Docker is. And Docker really is the most popular containerization environment. So Docker uses a client server architecture and the Docker client is a service which runs in a command line. And, and then the Docker daemon, which is run as a REST API within the command line, will accept the requests and interacts with the operating system in order to build the Docker images and run the Docker containers. And then the Docker image is a template of instructions, which is used to create containers. The Docker container is an executable package of applications and its dependencies together. And then finally, the Docker registry is a service to host and distribute Docker images among other users. So you'll also be asked to provide uh, what are the advantages of Docker over virtual machine. And, and this is something that comes up very consistently. In fact, um, you may want to even extend it as having what are the differences between having a dedicated machine, a virtual machine and a Docker or Docker like environment. And really, the, the arguments for Docker are just absolutely fantastic. You know, uh, first of all, Docker does contain and occupy, Docker containers occupy significantly less space than a virtual machine or a dedicated machine. The boot up time on Docker is significantly faster than a VM. Containers have a much better performance as they are hosted in a single Docker image. Docker is highly efficient and very easy to scale, particularly when you start working with Kubernetes. Easily portable across multiple platforms. And then finally, for space allocation, uh, Docker data volumes can be shared and reused among multiple containers. The, the argument against virtual machines is significant. And particularly if you're going into an older environment where a company is still using actual dedicated hardware and haven't moved to a cloud or cloud-like environment, your arguments for Docker are going to be very, very persuasive. Be very clear on what the advantages are for Docker over a virtual machine because you want to be able to succinctly share them with your team. And this is something that's important when you're going through the interview process, but also equally important, particularly if you're working with a company that's transitioning or going through a digital transformation where they aren't used to working with the tools like Docker, you need to be able to effectively share with that team what the benefits are. So how do we share Docker containers with different nodes? And in this instance, what you want to be able to do is leverage the power of Docker Swarm. So Docker Swarm is a tool which allows the IT administrators and developers to create and manage clusters of Swarm nodes within the Docker platform. And there are two elements to the node. There's the manager node and then there's the, the worker node. The manager node, as you'd assume, manages the entire infrastructure and the worker node is actually the work of the agent as it gets executed. So what are the commands to create a Docker Swarm? And so here we have an example of what a manager node would look like. And once you've created a Swarm on your manager node, you can now add worker nodes to that Swarm. And again, when you're stepping through this process, be very precise in the execution part that needs to be taken to be able to effectively create a Swarm. So start with the manager node, and then you create a worker node. And then finally, when a node is initialized as a manager node, it can immediately create a token, and that token is used for the worker nodes and associating the IP address with the worker nodes. Question 17, how to run multiple containers using a single service? It is possible to run multiple containers as a single service by using Docker Compose. And Docker Compose will actually run each of the services in isolation so that they can interact with each other. The language used to write out the Compose files that allow you to run the service is called YAML. And YAML stands for yet another markup language. So what is the use of a Docker file? So a Docker file actually is used for creating Docker images using the build command. So let's go through and show on the screen what that would look like. And this would be an opportunity where if you're actually in a technical interview, you could potentially even ask, hey, can I draw on a whiteboard and show you what the architecture for using the build command would look like and what the process would look like? Um, again, when you're going through an interview process, as someone who interviews a lot of people, one of the things that I really like is when an interview candidate does something that's slightly different. And in this instance, this is a great example of where you can stand up to the whiteboard and actually show what can actually be done 
through actually creating images on the whiteboard very quickly little square boxes where you can actually show the flow for creating a build environment as an architect this should be something that you are comfortable doing and by doing it in the interview and certainly you want to ask permission before you actually do it but doing this in the interview really helps demonstrate your comfortable feelings of working with these kind of architecture drawings so back to the question of creating a docker file so we go through and uh, we have a Docker file that actually then goes ahead and creates the Docker image, which then in turn creates the Docker container. And then we are able to push that out up to a Docker hub and then share that Docker hub with everybody else as part of the Docker registry with the whole network. So what are the differences between Docker image and Docker container? So let's go through the Docker image. So the Docker images are templates of a Docker container. An image is built using a Docker file and it stores that Docker file in a Docker repository or a Docker hub. Um, and you can use Docker hub as an example. And the image layer is a read only file system. The Docker container is a collection of the runtime instances of a Docker image. And the containers are created using Docker images and they are stored in the Docker daemon. And every container is a layer is a read write file system. So you can't replace the information. You can only append to it. So while you can actually use YAML for uh, writing your, so a question you can be asked is, instead of YAML, what can be an alternate file to build Docker Compose? So YAML is the one that is the default, but you can also use JSON. So if you are comfortable working with JSON, and my, that is something that you should be uh, get comfortable with, is you want to be able to use that to name your files. And as a frame of reference, uh, JSON is a logical way of being able to do value paired matching using a JavaScript like syntax. So you're gonna be asked to how to create a Docker container. So let's go through what that would look and we'll break it down task by task. So the task is gonna be create a MySQL Docker container. So to do that, you want to be able to build a Docker image or pull from a, an existing Docker image from a Docker repository or hub. And then you want to be able to then use Docker to create a new container, which has MySQL from the existing Docker image. Simultaneously, the layer of read write file system is also created on top of that image. And below at the bottom of the screen, we have what the command lines look for that. So what is the difference between a registry and a repository? So let's go through that. So for the Docker registry and repository, for the registry we have, a Docker registry is an open source server-side service used for hosting and distributing Docker images. Whereas in contrast, for repositories, a collection of multiple versions of a Docker image. In a registry, a user can distinguish between Docker images with their tag names. And then finally, on the registry, Docker also has its own default registry called Docker Hub. For the repository, it is a collection of multiple versions of Docker images. It is stored in a Docker registry, and it has two types, a public and private registry, so you can actually create your own enterprise registry. So you're going to be asked, you know, what are the cloud platforms that uh, support Docker? Really, you know, list them all. Uh, we have listed here Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud, Rackspace, but you could add in their IBM, Bluemix, could put in Red Hat, really any of the uh, cloud service providers out there today do support Docker. It's just become an industry standard. So what is the purpose of expose and publish commands in Docker? So if we go through, expose is an instruction used in Docker file, whereas publish is used in Docker run command. For expose, it is used to expose ports within a Docker network, whereas with publish, it can be used outside of a Docker environment. For Expose, it is a documenting instruction used at the time of building an image and running a container, whereas with Publish, it is used as to map a host port to a running container port. For Expose, it is the command used in Docker, whereas for Publish, we use the command dash P for when we're doing our command line used in Docker. And examples of these are Expose 8080, or with Docker, we would put in or for publish we would do the example docker run dash d dash p and then 0, .0, 0.0.0.80 80 colon 80 as our command line so let's look at continuous monitoring so with continuous monitoring how does nagios help in continuous monitoring of systems applications and service 
And so this is really just a, a high level question of using Nagios within your environment. And you should be able to just come back very quickly and say Nagios allows you to help manage the servers and check if they've been sufficiently utilized and if there are any task failures that need to be addressed. And so there are three areas of utilization and risk that you want to be able to manage. This is being able to verify the status and services of the entire network, the health of your infrastructure as a whole, and if applications are working properly together with web services and APIs that are reachable. So the second question you'll be asked is, how does Nagios help in continuous monitoring of systems, applications, and services? So it's able to do this by having the initial Nagios process and scheduler and the additional plugins that you would use for your network connect with the remote resources and the Nagios web interface to be able to run status checks on a predefined schedule. So what do you mean by Nagios Remote Plugin Executor or the MPRE of Nagios? So MPRE allows you to execute plugins on Linux Unix machines that allow you to do additional monitoring and machine metrics such as disk usage, CPU load, etc. What are the ports used by Nagios for monitoring purposes? In this example, there are three and they're easy to remember. So I would memorize these three, but they're essentially ports 5666, 5667 and 5668. So there are two types of checks within Nagios. So you will be asked for what is an active and passive check in Nagios. So an active check and is initiated by the Nagios process and is run on a regular schedule. A passive check is initiated and formed by an external application or process. So this may be where a system is failing and checks are results are submitted to Nagios for processing. And to continue with this for what is an active and passive check, active checks are initiated by the check logic within the Nagios daemon. Nagios will execute a plugin and pass information about what needs to be checked. Plugin will then check the operational state of the host or service and then process the results of the host or service check and send out notifications. In contrast with the passive check, it is an external application that initiates the uh, check. It writes the results of the check to an external command line file. Nagios reads the external uh, command file and places the results of all passive checks in a queue for later processing. So you can go back and revalidate. And then Nagios may send out notifications, log alerts, etc., depending on the results that they get from checking the information. So you're going to be asked to explain the main configuration file and its location in Nagios. So the main configuration file consists of a number of directives that affect how Nagios operates. So consider this as the configuration file that is read by both Nagios processor and the CGIs. So this will allow you to be able to manage the main configuration file that is placed into your settings directory. So what is the Nagios Network Analyzer? And again, hold out your four fingers because there are four options here. So the Nagios Network Analyzer R1 provides an in-depth look at all your network traffic source and security threats. Two, allows system admins to gather high level information on the health of your network. Three, provides a central view of your network traffic and bandwidth data. And then four, allows you to proactive in resolving outages, abnormal behavior, and threats before they affect critical business processes. So what are the benefits of HTTP and SSL certificate monitoring with Nagios? So with HTTP certificate monitoring, it allows you to have increased server and services and application availability, obviously very important. Fast detection of network outages and protocol failures, and it allows web transaction and web service performance monitoring. The SSL certificate monitoring allows you for increased website availability, frequent application availability, and provides increased security. So explain virtualization with Nagios. So in response to this, the first thing you should be able to talk about is how Nagios itself can run on many different virtualization platforms, including Microsoft Visual PC, VMware, Zen, Amazon, EC2, et cetera, et cetera. So just make sure you get that right off um, the bat. Nagios is able to provide capabilities to monitor an assortment of metrics on different platforms. It allows for ensure for quick detection of service and application failures and has the ability to be able to monitor against many metrics, including CPU usage, memory, networking, and VM status.
So name the three variables that affect recursion inheritance in Nagios. And it is name, use, and register. So name is a template name that can be referenced in other object definitions. Use specifies the name of the template object that you want to inherit its properties and variables from. And register indicates whether or not the object definition should be registered to Nagios. And on the right hand side of the screen, we have an example of what that script would look like. Again, you may want to be able to memorize this as it's something that you can actually write down and show someone if you're going through a technical interview. So why is Nagio said to be object oriented? And it fundamentally comes down to the object configuration format that you can use in your object definitions. It allows you to inherit properties from other object definitions. And this is typical of object oriented development and is now applied for the Nagios environment. So some of the objects that you can inherit are services, host, commands, and time periods. So finally, explain what is state talking in Nagios. And so there are really four options here when you're talking about state stalking. So state stalking is used for logging purposes in Nagios. It allows you to enable for a particular host or service uh, that Nagios will watch over very carefully. It will log any changes it sees in the output of the check results. And then finally helps the analysis of log files. Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.